What a great crowd. Good morning. Thank you for all being here today with us. My name is Deborah Robin. I'm excited to welcome you. I am the proud executive director of Jane Doe Inc., Massachusetts Coalition Against Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence. I use she, her pronouns. We are delighted to have you all with us today. I also stand here as a survivor of sexual assault. JDI, as we're also affectionately known, is the only membership-based coalition comprised of nearly 60 organizations across the state that is part of a broad network of services that support survivors, act as the hubs of expertise in their communities, and have a vision for prevention where everyone feels safe in their own homes, in their neighborhoods, respected no matter where they are or who they are with. We are joined today by several programs from across the Commonwealth. Please raise your hand if you are from the western part of the state. <laughs> if you are from the central part of the state. If you are from Metro West. If you are from the Northeast region. If you are from the southeastern part of the state. If you are from Boston, and if you represent a statewide organization. Our membership provides a wide array of services and resources, and you will hear from some of these programs today. These include 24-hour hotlines, rape crisis centers, community-based services, transitional housing, emergency shelter, many forms of advocacy, education, and training, and more. These programs work with those impacted by sexual assault, domestic violence across the lifespan, including children who are impacted directly and adult survivors of sexual and domestic violence. As you will see today, sexual and domestic violence are both inter- and multidisciplinary. This means that they are issues of public health, economics, human rights, public safety, and involve many, many systems. While we know that sexual and domestic violence are equal opportunity oppressors, we also know that not everyone is impacted similarly. There are vulnerable communities here and across the country and the world that face barriers in accessing services and systems. This is one of the many, many reasons that we also support the critical role that culturally specific services designed to reach the most marginalized communities need to exist. And in, among those, this is not an exhaustive list, is the Asian Task Force Against Domestic Violence, the Massachusetts Alliance of Portuguese Speakers, Journey to Safety, and the Network La Red, just to name a few. We also appreciate that all of our members work hard to provide an array of multicultural services in their community. And so this is an ongoing, evol uh, evolving uh, description as our state changes its demographics. But this is not just about gender justice, it's also about racial and social justice. Now I gotta do my... What do we really know about sexual and domestic violence? It's not easy to create a snapshot, and we are often asked about it, because there's a great deal that we don't know. Sexual and domestic violence are often unreported, underreported, not reported. What does even reported mean? Reported to who? Survivors don't use all of the traditional systems that we think about when we talk about reporting. And even if they are reported, the numbers don't tell us the full impact of the horrific trauma, harm, and pain that survivors experience, or the incredible strength and resilience that we witness daily. So within that context, I just want to point to a few data points, and so this information is also in your folder. In Massachusetts, there's limited statewide data is available regarding transgender and gender nonconforming populations. 
but national data shows that more than half of trans folks have experienced some form of intimate partner violence. Nearly one in two women and one in four men have experienced sexual violence victimization other than rape. Nearly one in three women and one in five women, five um, men, excuse me, this is in Massachusetts, experienced rape, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner. In 2018 in Massachusetts, there were 15 domestic violence homicides. 15 female victims were killed. Another four male perpetrators committed suicide. And here in Massachusetts also, the number of incidents of sexual violence reported to Massachusetts rape crisis centers in fiscal year 18 increased 15.4% over the previous year. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Sexual and domestic violence are the daily headlines. I think we all can agree with that. It's been this way for some time, and there's no evidence that that will change anytime soon. But our Commonwealth has made great strides and sets a tone for the nation with our strong network of services, our shared commitment to resources and responsive uh, legislation, and our collective efforts. We believe that there is strength in numbers. And also, before we continue, I want to say a few thank you and acknowledgments. And uh, we'll continue to do that through this morning. First of all, I want to thank the staff from Jane Doe, who are here today, making this event happen. Can you raise your hand so we can all see who you are? I also want to thank Paul White of the Carroll Group, who is our lobbyist. We have many partners here from state agencies, and we welcome you all and enjoy the partnership. There are also many aides here um, with us today. I'm not going to get everyone here, but I see Representative Joan Sino over there. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Senator Michael Moore, thank you for being here with us today. We have uh, Kelly Dwyer from the Governor's Council to address sexual and domestic violence. <laughs> and Representative Tommy Vitolo. Where are you? We're over here. <laughs> <laughs> and there are others, and we'll continue to recognize you through the morning. Um, Right now, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce my colleague and JDI's policy director, Maureen Gallagher. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Deborah, for those really <coughs> important remarks. I did want to recognize also Rep. Christina Minicucci has also arrived. There she is in the back. And the and others are, are coming in, so we will recognize you as we can. Um, well, a little bit out of order. I just want to, okay, small. Um, I want to um, just give people a little context for the rest of the program today. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes to go through our legislative and budget priorities, um, and then we will have um, what I would say the heart of our program, the panel discussion of uh, several Jane Doe members, and uh, myself and my colleague Deanna Monsero will be facilitating that conversation. Um, and we hope to have some time for questions, and absolutely we hope to have a little bit of time for networking at the end, so folks can connect with their uh, local program, who is here, um, and that's why we kind of did the regional thing. You can look at their name tags um, to see what region they're from, and we'll give you guidance for that later. Um, so that's just to give you a little bit of the day. I know that folks um, have other priorities, so I absolutely appreciate how many folks are here today. Um, it's really an incredible turnout, so thank you. Um, so let's get to the briefing part of the briefing, and thank you, Paul. Um, also want to, rep uh, before we start, rep uh, recognize Rep. Richard Haggerty here today. Um, and I think we got other folks, I think Deborah um, mentioned other folks who are here. So, um, as Deborah said, my name is Maureen Gallagher. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'll be, as I said, taking us through the, the Jane Doe budget priorities as well as some of our legislative priorities. Um, 
I do have to give a shout out to Union Square Donuts for the um, Jane Donut Halls. Um, they did um, donate some of those, so I want to mention them. Um, I hear Teal is a, uh, I haven't even looked at them, but I hope they're delicious. Um, and I also want to shout out the Jane Doe Policy Committee, because this work isn't done at Jane Doe in you know, isolation by myself and our staff. We have a policy committee of um, Jane Doe member programs. Um, we're growing that committee, and we also work with our programs in developing our, our public policy agenda. Um, I think uh, the policy committee members I see here are Stephanie Brown um, from Casa Mirna, Laura Van Zant is a emeritus <laughs> member of the policy committee, um, as the Sue Chandler is an emeritus member. Um, I know I'm missing somebody, Marsha Szymanski is here from the Pope, um, but we, we can't do this work alone. So let's kind of get right into it. Um, these are the three primary line items that Jane Doe advocates for in the state budget. Um, so you've heard from many of us about these. Um, there's the first line item is, is really the services line item um, that um, you know, shelters, um, rape crisis centers, community-based programs are all funded through. The second line is healthy relationships grant program, um, which is a prevention line item, and the sexual assault nurse examiner program line item. Um, you, see, you see a brief history, there's a little longer history on the handout that you have in your packet. Um, and, and we'll just go quickly through those. As I said, this first line item, these are the services that are provided in that uh, line item. Um, we are grateful that in fiscal year 19, the legislature and administration supported a $3 million increase in this line item, um, which is, as I said, it's really the primary state funding line item for these services. It's not the only one, but it's the most significant one. Um, and we want to recognize that many of you in the room both are member programs, but also the legislative members who have really been advocates for us here in the State House for this funding. The $3 million was distributed to rape crisis centers and to community-based domestic violence programs and really allowed um, programs to expand their capacity to provide core services, to provide um, culturally and linguistically competent and appropriate services to do some innovative work like web-based services and so um, we our request on this line this year is to maintain that increase and ma maintain the level of services which we are pleased that the governor included in his h1 budget now our request of level funding does not mean that there are not still areas of great need and i just want to highlight that we particularly want to um, mentioned the rape crisis centers in Massachusetts. There's only 17 of them, and they are um, continue to be underfunded, and they continue to have increased requests for services, particularly in the last year and a half, um, where more and more folks have been talking about sexual violence and calling them for services. And so we know that there are still unmet needs, and we will surely be back to talk to you about that. But this is also why we are focusing our, our primary budget request this year on prevention. Um, the governor's budget greatly increased this line item from $150,000 where it currently stands to a million dollars. Um, this is uh, our big request today is that the legislature, that the House and the Senate include this million dollars in your budgets. It, it's a very exciting time to be able to see a commitment and investment by uh, the administration in, in recognizing that we really have to get at the root causes of sexual and domestic violence and prevent them. And um, you know, all the service dollars in the world, um, while we need them, aren't gonna address this issue if we can't focus on prevention. The million dollars will allow us to build partnerships with the Department of Public Health, community-based rape crisis centers, domestic violence programs, um, to really develop and implement evidence-informed prevention strategies in all communities across the Commonwealth. We must change social norms, shift attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors, and this is not an easy feat, and it's going to take significant commitment and resources. Prevention is necessary if we want to curb the need for future services. It's really as simple as that. And it will reduce costs in so many other areas in the long run, in health care, in shelter and housing in um, so many um, ways in which sexual and domestic violence impacts people's lives. 
So the third line item is the sexual assault nurse examiner <coughs> and pediatric SANE line item, which is very critical. Um, this line item funds the 30 SANE sites in Massachusetts. It funds some of the rape crisis accompaniment um, to those um, SANE sites and also children's advocacy centers. Our request this year is for level services, and we are um, in communication with the same program. We know they're looking for to do some expansion, and they're seeking outside sources to do that. So, um, so right now we're asking for level funding in that. So next we turn to the legislative priorities. But before um, I get into the specific bills, I just want to provide some context in the way that Jane Doe thinks about our policy work and develops our policy priorities. Um, we, these up here are some of the guiding principles that we use to really make decisions about the work that we do and really be thoughtful about the impact of policy um, efforts that we may engage in. You know, we work on behalf of all survivors and we recognize that multiple different oppressions intersect and result in greater harm to some communities. So in order to uphold the dignity and human rights of all people, we aspire to assess that impact on those communities who are most oppressed and disproportionately represented in some systems and more harmed by some systems. And so um, I just give you this for context as to maybe why there are some bills we might work on and some bills we might support and not support that may not fall into what you, what you expect. Um, and we also, our priorities focus on the areas of education prevention, human rights, economic justice, and other systems change. So as you'll see from your handout, there's seven plus legislative priorities, so I'll just touch on a couple of them. Um, we will absolutely be available to talk to people if you have questions after. Um, all of these bills are important, so the fact that I'm only talking about a few um, does not make any others less important. And also, the bills that Jane Doe um, work on over the course of the session are many. These are, this is a list, this is our priorities, and this is what we're focusing on our briefing today. But it's not to say that there aren't a lot of other really important pieces of legislation that we will respond to and address and um, are happy to talk with legislative staff about at any time. So an act relative to sexual violence on higher education campuses is a priority, again, a very key priority this session. Um, Senator Moore, who was here, was one of our co-sponsors. We were thrilled that he could, oh, he's still here. So we're thrilled, thrilled that he could be here. Um, um, he's the, the lead sponsor on the Senate version of the bill. Um, you know, many schools across the Commonwealth are, are doing good work in this area, and this legislation will ensure that all schools are doing the best that they can to respond to sexual violence and promote prevention messaging in their communities. In our uh, current political climate, um, and the rolling back of Title IX protections by the federal government, this legislation will send a strong message to Massachusetts students that schools here will take their experiences seriously and their concerns and will remain committed to ending sexual violence. Students will have access to support on and off campus, privacy and confidentiality will be protected, and that students and staff will, re will receive information, education, and counseling. Um, and let's skip ahead. Um, I also want to mention the Campus Climate Survey Bill, which is a really important co component to this bill, and some of this language is in Senator Moore's version of the bill, um, which will require schools to do climate surveys um, every two years. And it's really an important um, piece of this so that schools are actually identifying what are the needs on their campuses, what are the experience of students on their campuses, where are the areas in which they need to, to do better um, and make improvements. I also um, want to talk about an act to, relative to healthy use um, because it really connects to both our prevention budget request and campus sexual assault work. Um, sexual, sexuality education that provides education on consent and building healthy relationships is really one part of what we mean when we're talking about prevention. And the LGBTQT inclusive curriculum is really vital, and we're really pleased that this language is in the bills because we want all students to feel represented and heard um, when these issues are discussed in their school. You know, while the work on campuses is incredibly important to address and prevent sexual violence, we have to be engaging youth well before they first step foot in a college classroom, on a campus, 
Uh, we need to, to provide spaces for them to talk about these issues, to learn about consent, respect, equity. Um, we really need to, to be providing the tools and making those spaces for students. So this is a really critical piece of um, prevention. And sort of the third uh, bill that I'll just talk a little bit more about is an act to protect the civil rights and safety of all Massachusetts re residents, which you would more commonly know as the Safe Communities Act. Um, this has um, always been a Jane Doe priority. Our member programs work with immigrant survivors every single day. Many who are fearful of going to court to get a restraining order, to um, calling the police if they're experiencing violence, and even to access services. Um, you know, survivors really have to be assured that they can have access to support, services, the criminal justice system, um, and that it won't result in, a, in more harm to them or their families or the people that are around them when, you know, when folks are responding to their concerns. You know, immigrants are all across Massachusetts. They shouldn't have to live in fear. Um, and, you know, we shouldn't have a, a, a hierarchy or a, a distinction between who can have access and who can't based on their immigration status. So we'll continue to work hard for this and hope folks support that. Um, there are several economic justice related bills um, and it's really a core focus of the work that Jane Doe does um, and our member programs do working with, um, with survivors um, who have experienced violence and who have really great economic impacts to them, and so we find it really important to do work on issues related to employment, public benefits, housing, um, which are just a very few areas um, that impact survivors' lives. Um, and we really um, will support um, this legislation here. The On Solid Ground Coalition doesn't detail that, but that's the work of that coalition is really supporting economic equity. Um, you know, and, and as I said at the beginning, we don't do this alone. Um, this is very brief briefing on the legislative bills, and as I said, I'm happy to talk about it, but I do just want to emphasize again that, that Jane Doe is working in collaboration and coalition with so many other organizations, some of whom are here today. Um, you know, the Every Voice Coalition is a, is a really important um, student-led um, activist group, and we've got, I see Danielle there, a member of Every Voice here. Um, and also a member of program uh, staff person, um, you know, working on campus sexual assault. Um, so we're, uh, you know, taking their lead on some of these issues. Um, the Mira Coalition, the Mass Immigrant and Refugee um, Coalition, is really critical that we work with. There's a number of organizations working on healthy youth in that coalition, and on the Family Cap. Um, so we work together to. Um, really bring our, our various perspectives and expertise and knowledge together. Um, and so you may see various groups of us in your offices um, to talk to you about these pieces of legislation um, because it really is, um, it, takes, um, it takes all of us to make change. And so that's what our goal is. Um, so having said all that, um, again, we will have time for questions, I hope, or I'll be around for questions. Um, Checking my time here, not bad. Um, but I really want to make sure that we have time and segue into our um, our next and most important part of our uh, <coughs> event, which is our uh, legislative or could be a legislative panel, our member program panel, um, who uh, I will call up here in a second. I do want to re um, recognize that Representative Tammy Govea is here. Um, I hope I said that right. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, I don't ever recognize the legislative staff, but I know so many of you are here representing your offices and that you are such key critical folks in, um, in this work, so I thank you all for coming. Um, but yes, so let's, um, let's move on to the panel. Um, we uh, would like to invite my colleague, Deanna Mancera, um, Director of Membership and Program. Oh, there she is. Um, and then invite our panelists up. <coughs> see up here, um, um, Amrit Fernandez Prabhu from uh, Center for Hope and Healing. She's the Data and Capacity Building Manager. Yeah, come on up. Um, Lisetta Putnam, Executive Director of Independence House uh, from the Cape Cod <coughs> area. And I should say, Amrit is from the Center for Hope and Healing is in the Lowell area. Um, Paulo Pinto. 
executive director of the Mass Alliance of Portuguese Speakers, and they have a couple of different offices in Cambridge and Lowell, but they're a statewide organization. Um, and Sabrina Santiago, uh, co-executive director from the network Lored, um, and the network uh, Lored is also a statewide organization working with LGBTQ survivors. Hi everyone. Good morning. Um, so my name is Diana Mancera. I am the Director of Membership and Programs of the Massachusetts State Coalition Against Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence, uh, known as Jane Doe or JDI. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and ella. And I am so delighted to be here moderating this panel with Maureen Gallagher. Uh, but before we start, I know you all have seen on our slides the hashtags and um, at our tagging at Jane Doe. So if you are doing any social media, please use the hashtag we have here. It's an opportunity for, um, for folks to know that you are here uh, supporting hashtag supporting survivors. So please do that. Um, so again, we have uh, four of our member programs. I know this may not uh, be a full representation of over 60 plus member programs that Deborah was mentioning, uh, but this, our job for today, for our panelists and for the two moderators, Maureen and myself, is going to be to potentially show you all here and particularly our legislators that um, the services that are on a day-to-day -day basis our programs do. Um, so, Please welcome um, our panelists, so if we can give them a round of applause for them. I also do want to take this opportunity to recognize that um, even though, again, we don't have a full, we couldn't have all the 60 plus member programs and speaking about their programs, um, but I do want to recognize that this may not be a full representation of all the programs and the services, the kind of services that this programs do, uh, particularly when we speak on the work and the uniqueness of cultural specific communities, um, such as black women, trans black women, Asian communities, indigenous people, rural communities, people with disabilities, etc. cetera. Um, so again, thank you for being here. So why don't we begin by hearing a little bit about you, who you are. We'll have the pictures and the names. So if you can um, just begin with your name. There's a mic in there. Um, name, pronouns, and answering the question of, could you share a, a specific experience of where your organization made a significant impact supporting survivors as they navigate through the system? <laughs> so here, I'm up for it. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you, Deanna. Thank you, Jane Doe, for um, inviting me and all of us to participate on this panel. And <clears throat> we're warned that our time is limited, but so I'll try to keep it quiet and short. Um, I think um, when I think about um, the impact that our programs have. I try to think about the, the survivors that we serve and the complexity and diversity of survivors. And I think it's important, of course, that we focus, remember that. But the impact mainly has to do with the, it's, it's profound. It's on um, physical safety, emotional safety, mental health, well-being, and for my program in particular, but I know I speak for all my colleagues in the room and everyone here, especially those of us that provide shelter, that for um, many survivors that come into shelter <coughs> specifically, and there are a wide array of programs, um, that when they enter shelter, it's probably the first time for many that they have felt a sense of safety and well-being. So um, I, it, it's hard to think of one example, but I will, um, I wanna, I did bring some stories to share because we talk about putting survivors at the center of the work. So I feel it's important to bring some of the survivors' voices into the room. And interestingly enough, just before I was asked to present on this panel, I received a letter 
from a woman that had used um, our services in particular 10 years ago. And um, I'll hold it up. It's dated um, February 1st, 2019, and it's handwritten, and I have her permission to share it. And it's not very specific. I have some more specific stuff to share, but I thought it would be important to start with that, especially for the legislators in this room, to um, really see how this funding, a small amount of funding, goes a long way and the effects last well beyond the time that we're able to even see survivors. So this is Loretta, and um, she said, they're staff of Independence House. My name is Loretta, and she says her last name. I was a client there several years ago, and she underlined several, just around a decade now, for several years, meaning she worked with us for several years. My main counselor at that time was, and she says the counselor's name, um, and I'm sure that the staff has turned over many times since then, and that's okay. I was driving a couple of days ago, and they mentioned Independence House. We're celebrating our 40th year, so there was something on the radio. And a smile immediately came to my face. You see, I cannot think of Lasada and the staff that was there at the, or and of the current staff without having an overwhelming sense of gratitude. I am thankful, and she underlined thankful, for all that you did for me and are doing for others. I actually have to sniff back tears of gratefulness and joy when I think of all that you did for me. I won't belabor the point. There is so much that I could say, but I won't. You all are busy enough, I'll just say thank you, and that's in caps. This is 10 years later, and we hadn't heard from the survivor. So even though she doesn't get into her story, I can tell you a little bit about Loretta. Loretta was married to someone in the community that was very influential. He was well known, had a top level job, and she had been enduring um, physical abuse for um, many years, the gamut, physical, um, emotional, financial. And for her, the idea of saying anything about that was, as you can imagine, very scary. But she did reach out to Independence House through our hotline. And 10 years ago, we did not have a shelter. There were no, those resources were not on the Cape. So we safe homed her. We put her up in a safe place to stay where she was able to um, make some plans. The staff assisted her with navigating through the court system so that she could um, obtain a protection order, a restraining order, which she was able to do and was able to move back into her home. We um, also helped her with being able to um, assure that her children were safe and that she would maintain custody of her children. And um, throughout the time, the reason why she was involved with Independence House for so long was that the abuse had gone on for so long that mentally and emotionally um, she had been broken down, to put it mildly. And by the time she was, you know, sort of, we use the word terminated with our, um, with the work at Independence House, um, we didn't recognize her. She was back to who uh, originally she was before she got married, strong, confident, feeling good about the type of parent that she, um, realizing that the way she wanted to parent was how she was able to parent her children. And um, she did get housing and a job. And this is obviously not how everyone's story ends, but this is a great story. And I just wanted to share that. And I have more, but I only have two minutes, so if I have time, I'll share more. <laughs> Um, so my name is Amrit Fernandez Prabhu. I am the Data and Capacity Manager at the Center for Hope and Healing. I use she and her pronouns. Um, and when you ask about um, survivors navigating the system, a particular survivor comes to mind. Um, we recently, a couple of years ago, worked with a survivor who um, is a man, had an intellectual and developmental disability, more commonly shortened to IDD. Um, and was a survivor of sexual violence. Um, and our agency came to meet him at a hospital through the SANE program, and so our agency does medical advocacy where we meet survivors um, at any time of day, it's 24-7. And so we met this um, person, this man at a 
during um, med a medical advocacy call, and then later um, advocated like alongside him, with and for him, um, through the medical and healthcare process through the, that system, and then later, as time went on, through um, DDS, which is the Department of Disability Services, and DPPC, which is, uh, I wrote this down, Disabled Persons Protection Committee, and then also through housing. And what was apparent to me, um, as we worked you know, along several months, was that um, there was a little collaboration, um, because the systems talk very little to each other, and where this person had an intellectual and developmental disability, where he was a survivor of violence, um, there was, it was important for us to get all the partners at the same table multiple times, um, more frequently than, than would maybe a, a different survivor, right? And so, um, and then as we did that, it, was, it became more apparent that he was better able to understand his rights and his identities um, as a survivor of sexual violence, as a person with a disability, and as a man. Um, and then better able to navigate the system both for himself and ask um, what needs he needed, what needs he, um, and services he needed out of those, each of those um, agencies. And so what the, I now notice, so now a couple of years later, with the reduction in state funding, um, some of his caseworkers have been cut out of all of those agencies. Um, and so the implication on rape crisis centers like ours is the added, I would say, I don't want to say burden, but the added need for us to navigate all of his identities and the services <coughs> relative to each of those identities that he, he has, um, and for survivors like him, um, navigating all of those systems. Good morning. Paulo Pinto, Executive Director of MAPS, uh, pronouns he, him, and his. Um, we have at MAPS uh, currently over 300 uh, cases of domestic violence and sexual assault that we're working with, and many of them start with a phone call that we receive at, at one of our six offices throughout the state. Um, and um, to show you in the impact that we're, we have on some of the work, uh, the the clients that we work with, the victims and survivors that we work with. I'll tell you this quick story. Um, a call came in through to one of our offices, and uh, um, it actually came from a shelter in a remote uh, rural um, area part of the state of Massachusetts. And it, the, the woman on the shelter said to our advocate, um, that they had a woman and two kids who had just been dropped off by the police um, at the shelter. Um, and no one at the shelter spoke Portuguese. So the shelter called because they needed our help. Our advocate um, who uh, started speaking with the, uh, right away with the, with the, with the woman uh, quickly found out that the, this woman had, um, it was from Brazil, um, she had been brought here by, with her two kids um, by her American husband. Um, who um, they, they were introduced virtually uh, over, the, over the web. Um, he traveled there. Um, uh, they got married in Brazil. Uh, he petitioned for her, so she came legally with her kids to uh, the United States um, with lots of promises for a better life uh, for her and her two kids. They came from, very, um, from, a, very, um, from a struggling place. Uh, and uh, so with many difficulties. So they, they arrived um, and they went to live in his house uh, in a very rural, remote area. Uh, there were not many um, homes, or actually there were no homes nearby. So um, it, the nearest home was actually about a couple of miles away. And so um, the, you know, the, the woman explained to our advocate that for the last three years they had been imprisoned um, by this man the husband, who uh, did not allow the kids to go to school, um, you know, and, uh, and they were um, mentally and physically abused. 
And so, uh, finally, until one day, the um, the the uh, while the husband was uh, violent, violently uh, beating her, um, he was so distracted that the daughter was able to get away and run. Um, and she ran, and then she ran into someone's house, uh, and she asked for help. Finally, the police arrived, and to make this shorter, um, the the police arrived. They arrested the, the the husband, and that's how they she and her kids ended up at the shelter. So, um, of course, uh, our advocates um, quickly began working about uh, trying to uh, to see if we could get a um, get our shelter someplace closer to one of our offices, so that we could number one so better support her and her kids, and also be able to give her a sense of community. Uh, where she came from, there, she didn't know anyone that was uh, Portuguese speaking, and uh, and so she didn't have a community. She really needed to have that for her. So when we looked for shelter, there was no shelter available, um, and so our advocates began working on uh, with uh, other resources, knowing that there are several commu uh, churches in our community. We contacted churches, and we were able to get one of the churches who took uh, the, the woman and the kids in, and so, um, which was fantastic. Um, and uh, um, once uh, once we got that, we helped with, the, uh, with transportation to relocate the, the family, and helped uh, and uh, connect them with a variety of health and uh, social services, including enrolling the kids in school, so that now the kids were in school as well as uh, they were in a safe place at, uh, at, through the church. And um, the church, then members of the church helped them find a job, um, and so the mother was able to quickly, fairly quickly, begin to, uh, to work. Um, the daughter um, turned 16 and, and began working as well. Eventually, they got their own apartment and um, and the, they're now um, in a much safer um, and uh, place. Uh, and all of that because our advocates are bilingual, bicultural, and know the resources in the community, know what, who's available, know who to talk to. And so as a result, we um, uh, facilitated a, a new start uh, of, a, of, their, of their lives. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Sabrina Santiago, um, and I, uh, as mentioned earlier, I work for the Network Lored. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and they. And um, when I was asked to talk about uh, this question, I started thinking about how often all of us are constantly dealing with systems um, in our everyday lives. We deal with systems when we take our children to school, we register our children, we talk to teachers. We deal with systems when we register our car, we pay that excise tax. We deal with systems when we do our annual taxes, when we pay our rent, when we go to the bank. Um, we go through systems every day, um, some of us through immigration processes, um, paying that traffic ticket, uh, uh, what is the word, um, challenging the parking ticket you got. <laughs> um, so we deal with it all the time. And I, I think that what we don't think about is that Survivors are also dealing with all those systems that we all are dealing with. And then, when in crisis, are dealing with even more systems. And so there's a layering of those systems and those experiences of, of um, trying to figure out how they work, um, being overwhelmed by them, while for survivors, also dealing with trauma, of uh, their own trauma, their children's trauma, and fear of their sa for their safety. And so um, I think that one of the things we need to really think about is how do we make space to acknowledge that that's the experience of survivors. Um, and at the network, um, what we try to do is um, support survivors in meeting the goals that they have created for themselves, but also to help them figure out how to navigate systems and try to help shoulder that burden that is on them. Um, and I want to tell you a little about, about someone we worked with. Um, she was a transgender woman of color, um, and she was fleeing abuse from her wife. And she was very afraid about whether it made sense to leave, what it would mean to look for help, a place to live, what to do with her children, how to support her children. Um, she worried about um, well, whether she'd be believed, um, whether there actually would be services available for her specifically, and, um, and also would the systems that exist even see her as a woman and 
um, a woman in need of help. Um, and so she contacted us through our 24-hour hotline, um, you know, in the middle of the night, in a moment where she had some space. Um, that was the first time she reached out to us, and it was a while before she, um, <coughs> before she left, um, when things escalated in, from her partner. Um, and she fled with her children, um, and she called us um, for housing. And at the time, our housing program um, didn't have space in it. We had the capacity to hold to um, offer services to 12 individuals for up to two years of, of, of housing stabilization funds. Um, but at that moment, we didn't have space. So she was in the position of, of having to figure out what to do with her children. She was able, luckily, to find a, a family member who could take her children while she tried to figure this out. But then she was bouncing between homeless shelters and couches at friends' houses, not knowing where she would be at each night, while also dealing with all those systems that just exist for all of us, right? Um, when about three weeks after she left and was in that position, we had a space open up, and so she entered a confidential space in our program, and we um, and when she started the work of finding an apartment but that would be eligible for our housing um, rental assistance program. And so she's doing all that work while also worrying about her children. Her children were in and out of school, not very consistently. She was getting calls from the school. She had DCF getting involved and was in great fear of her partner, her wife, finding her. Um, and so a lot of our work with her was navigating those systems. And one specific area was the court system. Um, she was a predominantly Spanish-speaking uh, survivor, and we did a lot of advocacy to make sure she had a translator there. Um, but then we were also fielding a lot of homophobic and transphobic questions about who she was, did she really experience this, um, then things about uh, having to educate court personnel about LGBTQ communities and that trans individuals do experience partner abuse, and that um, and then often just correcting the misgendering that would happen in the system. And so all of this was happening. She was so overwhelmed. She's in this overwhelming process that she doesn't fully understand because she's holding so much information and her own trauma and her children's trauma. Um, and the process is not only overwhelming, but often demoralizing. And so what I want to take from this is um, this experience is that we need to figure out how to support survivors in navigating these systems. Um, and what's hard is that so often the systems are set up first, you have to prove you're worthy of help. And then you add in homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, racism, classism, anti-Semitism, and the anti-immigrant sentiments in our country. All of those things create incredible um, barriers to survivors. And I keep thinking back to what if we weren't here? What would have been her experience, right? What She would have been dealing with all of that and still couch surfing, staying in homeless shelters, not knowing where she'd be each night. And then I find myself sometimes grateful that we have these services, but being able to provide 12 spaces for someone, for, for people in our communities, because we turn a lot of people away. And that's, that's hard. And as a community-based organization, like this is not, the staff that work the network are not people who just come in for a job and check out. This is our communities, these are our lives, these are our people, and so we care deeply. Um, and, what, and I find myself also wondering, if we weren't here in the middle of that night for that 24-hour hotline, would she have been able to leave at all? Would she have had any support? And then I wonder again, I wonder, would she have gone back, as so often survivors do? So I feel like the impact on folks from our communities is deep, it is painful, um, and we need to figure out how to work on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for bringing those really important and powerful stories and experiences in the room. Um, I do want to recognize that I see Rep. Lindsay Sabadosa is here. Thank you for being here. And Rep. Jim Hawkins. Thank you again for um, for sharing a little bit about some of the stories that your staff and the organization has faced. So that's just a little bit of 
what survivors go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so we know that sexual and domestic violence impacts different communities differently. Clearly, Sabrina and Paul have talked a little bit about that, um, as well as um, Gamrith and Vesera. But uh, particularly communities who where individuals already be facing barriers, which you spoke a little bit about that, um, and accessing the services, right? So um, if you can talk a little bit about Sabrina, this question is actually for you, so I'm glad that you're holding the mic. Um, could you describe some of the uniqueness, and you did touch a little bit on this, but you can, if you can speak a little bit about the barriers um, impact on the access for L LGBTQ survivors um, that the Net Willow Road Ladder Services? Yes, yes I can. Um, so the differences and the unique barriers that exist for LGBTQT individuals results from an intersection of the abuse and homo homophobia, biphobia, and the transphobia that we experience. And so, for instance, um, a gay male abuser might tell his newly out partner that um, this is just how gay relationships work. And if that survivor was raised believing the stereotypes that we're all taught about uh, gay relationships potentially being violent or unhealthy, then maybe that survivor will believe that. And I think that's then compounded by that survivor going to their college campus and seeing a sign that talks about domestic violence and a woman on that poster, and that man thinking, that's something that happens to women. That's not my experience, that's not me. Or I think about um, the abuser of a transgender individual who threatens to um, threatens her partner, if you leave me, I will call the police and I will report you for child abuse. And see it, how fast they take your children away. And with a history of transgender individuals losing visitation and custody of their children simply because of their gender identity, that's not a risk most parents would take. Or the lesbian woman who decides to leave her wife and go into emergency shelter, but then when in shelter pretends to be straight and have a male partner because she's afraid of what, how she'll be treated by other residents or, other, or staff. And then the abuser follows her into shelter by pretending to be a survivor them, herself and, and being a place to stay. I have more, more, more examples. Um, I could go on and on. Um, I want to give a couple more. I think about um, what is the impact when a bilingual gay man um, goes to court for his reading order because they're afraid of being raped again and they go to court and there's not a, a translator available. And the court says, you went to college in the US, you speak good enough English, we're not going to wait for the translator. And then after going through the hearing process is told, you're a man, toughen up, work it out with your boyfriend. Or the undocumented black transgender man who has been stabbed by their partner but is afraid to call the police because they worry, are they gonna be believed? Are the police going to call ICE, or will they be killed by the police? These are all real examples of people's experiences every day accessing services. And most of them I talked about are very much grounded in, or have a foundation of homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia. But there's also racism and sexism and all other forms of oppression that, that serve to erase survivors' experiences. that uh, 2019, and we're still talking about a lot of those barriers that you just mentioned, Sabrina. So thank you so much for actually being very specific about the examples. Um, so, Paulo, um, you speak a little bit about the sense of community and the connection is, um, that your organization has been able to create uh, with people who, um, whose primary language is Portuguese. So could you speak a little bit about um, the unique challenges that this community uh, face to, in order for them to uh, be able to get access to some of the services? Absolutely. Um, so 
an immigrant population, um, you know, faces all the same, all the barriers that everyone faces and obstacles and challenges, especially as victims and survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. But when you're an immigrant, you face a few more, as you can imagine. Um, obviously, you know, um, the anti-immigrant um, sentiment is something that all of us immigrants uh, struggle with every day. We feel that pressure, that pressure, uh, pressure uh, turns into fear um, and, uh, and uh, contributes to many other stresses in, in our lives. Um, but all, some of the uh, barriers are economic, social, um, but, um, um, barriers, but one of the biggest ones is obviously language and cultural, um, for our, uh, especially for our victims and survivors. And uh, um, the lack of uh, language access is um, and culturally sensitive services is is crucial to getting uh, to allowing people to get services and and rebuild their lives and and and. and uh, yeah, um, but you know it's really um, you know um, difficult sometimes for us as advocates uh, for our staff at MAPS to um, help people when 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 uh, the courts themselves don't have um, you know enough interpreters. Even when we put in a, a request for an interpreter, many times uh, we get there and there's no interpreter available. And so our advocates are thrown into sometimes having to, to act as translators and interpreters, which is really problematic. Our advocates are not trained and certified interpreters. Um, but sometimes we have no choice. And so um, it's really uh, hard um, for, for, to do this work. Um, additionally, when, when clients are referred to other organizations, because we can't do this work alone, we need shelters, we, we need to connect our, um, uh, our clients to, to, to health care, social services, um, uh, you know, across the, the, the systems, um, it, you know, we many times cannot just make a referral or say, go here, go there. We actually have to accompany our clients to those appointments. We have to act as interpreters and translators at the hospitals, at the police station, um, at uh, um, social service organizations, at shelters, and just like, you know, the, the case that I told you about. I can tell you that um, the, the, my advocate said, you know, when she started speaking to that client at the shelter, you know, when, when that woman was on the phone and she didn't know who she was gonna talk to, but when our advocate started speaking to, to, to that woman in Portuguese, that woman just broke down because she didn't know, and, and then she recognized the, the, the pronunciation. It, it was not just someone who spoke Portuguese, but spoke Portuguese like her. It was culturally uh, sensitive, and and the, uh, and we quickly um, the woman quickly went from uh, fear to being hopeful uh, that she finally had someone on her side, um, and so that's really about. Um, some of the obstacles and challenges that uh, our community face and how we break them uh, through um, you know, linguistically and culturally competent services that we offer. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, as a person who, whose English is under first language, I very much appreciate having cultural specific programs that speak the language that many of us, um, you know, acculturation, that was one of my hardest things to do, coming into a country that I didn't speak the language, they didn't know the system, so I very much appreciate that um, that an organization like, like MAPS exists. Thank so, you. Thank you. Um, Lissetta, um, <laughs> many of us uh, uh, are very familiar with the Cape as like the place that we go for the weekend, or the place that we go for vacation in the summer, but there's much more to know about the Cape, and there's a lot of the work that you do in the Cape. So if you can speak a little bit about um, the unique challenges as well that Independence House and their staff faces um, working with some of the remote and rural areas in the Cape. Mm -hmm. Well, the Cape is a place you come for the weekend, but it's also a place where I and many other people live, work, raise our families, and live there year-round. And, um, you know, the Cape is an interesting place, especially in the winter. Um, it is, um, if, you, if you're in Hyannis, some of you in the room, I'm sure you know that, or certain parts of the Cape, it's a lot more, a little bit more dense. And, but if you go to places like um, Provincetown, Truro, Wellfleet, East Ham, um, it's spread out. There is inadequate, you know, public transportation. Um, you 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 better have a car, or else just to get from East Ham, for example, 
um, to our office on the Lower Cape, which is how we've tried to um, address that barrier, transportation. Um, even if you, if you don't have a car, you might as well be going to Germany because um, the public transportation is woefully inadequate. And there is a bus service, but um, where you get dropped off, you may still have to um, find a way to get to the office. So we have to supplement that at our organization with um, transportation assistance. Some of our staff actually will uh, provide transportation for, um, you know, for survivors just to get to our services. So just um, also limited resources. So of course, collaboration is um, an important part of the work that we do because, uh, you know, it's one of everything or sometimes none of anything. <laughs> so we have to be pretty comprehensive in the way that we approach the work um, with survivors. Um, other issues that we face on the Cape in a rural community is really lack of privacy. So that um, having an organization like, uh, like Independence House within our community, but also in any rural community is really important because everybody knows everybody's business and um, survivors are assured of their pri of you know confidentiality and privacy um, when they use the services of Independence House. Um, it's also just being aware of um, uh, safety is probably a compounding issue, um, given that we have 15 towns, 15 police departments, and um, everybody knows each other again. So we, we now have a shelter on the Cape, and I know that it's, um, it's you know, sort of the idea that shelters should be confidential no more is kind of a new way of thinking. But in our community, it is absolutely essential because it's, again, it's so self-contained that um, we have to assure people's safety by keeping that um, as secret as possible, although we know that's difficult to do. Um, so a lack of transportation, um, we have somebody on staff, a staff attorney that we just hired and she, I was talking to her actually yesterday um, about how things are going and she said, we need a bilingual attorney. And I said, where are we going to find that? <laughs> you know, seriously, because again, our community is um, somewhat homogenous, but yet we have um, survivors that um, are under the radar that need those types of services. So we have to um, really figure out how to meet those needs. So I mean, yes, I could enumerate you know, um, all the challenges we face, but I will say that Independence House, and I'm sure all of our organizations that work in rural communities, we're often um, the last stop, the one place that um, people turn to because they know that, um, as Sabrina said, our staff, they don't check out. They're there, they believe in the mission. They're there to work with survivors and we're gonna figure out a way to get it done. So with that said, I will stop there. Thank you so much. Um, um, yeah, so uh, again, really important um, that this is sort of a snapshot of um, Really, some of the really, uh, really, really, some of the the additional challenges that folks experience, seem, depending on the community that they come from or the identity that they have. Um, so, shifting a little bit, um, supporting survivors of sexual and domestic violence is, as we've heard, really of critical importance. But it's also important that we advance strategies to prevent gender-based violence in the first place. We currently have a prevention request before the legislature of a million dollars, and so I, I think we should focus a little bit on prevention here right now. Um, and I think I'll start with Amrit, if that's okay. Um, if you would like to talk about the prevention work CHH is doing and how that could be enhanced with more resources in both yours and other communities. Sure, thank you. Um, so our mission at the Center for Hope and Healing, maybe I'll start with our vision. Our vision is to have a world free from sexual violence, right? And our, in order to do that, it can't be, we can't just do intervention work. Um, so our prevention work, uh, our prevention program is called Hope Prevents. 
um, hope being the catalyst um, in preventing sexual violence at all levels. And our Hope Prevents program, so our prevention program, um, is intentional at three levels, or three like sub-programs, if you will. And so that we have an engaging men and boys program, an LGBTQ slash T program, and a um, youth program. So we focus in those three communities where um, to really reduce the impact of oppression and increase protective factors in those communities. And so the, the real goal is to raise awareness, um, co-create knowledge, and develop skills, um, like I said, in reducing the impact of oppression. Um, and the programs, how the work is done is by community-led organizing and um, workshops. It's a lot of like workshops based um, through healthy relationships, which is part of what the bill um, is asking for. And so um, I guess the, the intentionality of the three programs or the three like branches of Hope Prevents is in order to, um, the more we're building in community and addressing violence within community um, is to, is, um, is to, the more we educate within community, we're like reducing um, violence because we're then, what I see is like the more we're educating communities, right, where it's also increasing our intervention um, work because then people are saying, oh, that did happen to me or we're, we are seeing those things happen, the more we're going out into high schools and middle schools and community centers and the more we're doing work with um, young men and boys, um, the more people say like, oh, okay, I might send my um, wife and daughters to you or my partners or, or things like that. So it equally increases our intervention work um, at the more we do prevention work. And so it, the sort of both our hope work and our healing work kind of go hand in hand, hence the Center for Hope and Healing. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's great. I love how you tied that up. That's great. Um, uh, Lissetta, what would you like legislators to know about the importance of prevention work in the community research? So I was trying to, was trying to um, think about this a little bit, and you know, I I want I want to be um, you know cute, smart, and funny, and come up with this um, pithy. Uh, so I thought about prevention as um, GPS for the future, and um, that's that's really what I want our legislators to know. And the reason why I say that is. We've been doing prevention work for some time at Independence South, and a lot of the work that we do is um, bystander intervention with youth through the M MVP program. And I like to tell stories because I think stories give the full picture of um, the ways in which having a GPS empowers um, youth, and I think all of us, to think about um, the root causes of um, domestic and sexual violence. And in thinking about that, um, what is the, if you, if you will, to use a, a public health word is, um, what is the antidote? And it is really um, getting to a place to recognize that even though, even listening to my colleagues talk, domestic and sexual violence seems so big and so overwhelming. But when we start to think about, um, you know, 20 years in the future, it doesn't have to be overwhelming. We can think about where do we want to be. So the story that comes to mind um, is something that actually happened in, in our county, in, um, in Hyannis at the Barnstable High School, where we've been doing bystander work for some time. And um, a lot of um, youngsters are engaged in that program. Um, and it, it varies, some years more, some years less. But um, a, a significant thing happened which really highlighted to me what happens when youth and all of us recognize that we have some tools that we can use to effect change. And the story is that there was a, um, a famous folk singer who was supposed to come and perform at their school in a concert. This famous folk singer had been um, had allegedly um, abused his wife, and it was later determined that he had abused his wife. 
And when the students who were involved in our um, MVP program learned of this, they actually wrote a letter to, the, to their school principal and demanded that this person not perform at their school because it was not reflecting um, the type of world and community that they were trying to create. And they insisted that the concert be canceled. And it was picked up in the newspaper nationally and locally. And guess what? The concert was canceled. But I don't believe that would have happened had um, those youth you know, not participated in the bystander um, prevention program. They realized that they have the power to create a culture, a world, and a community that, um, that they envision. And, and that's one where uh, domestic violence and sexual violence is, it, is not passed over because someone is famous. <coughs> Enough said. No, I want to note that um, there are currently some programs in Massachusetts that receive a very limited amount of federal rape prevention education funding, but the program and many programs are doing prevention work and they're raising money to do that. They're, um, you know, they're figuring out other ways to do it and so this is why we need a state investment to really help support that work. Um, you know, across all programs who don't have the resources to do it. And I, I just want to give an opportunity if any other folks want to respond around prevention if you have any comments about it. Well, um, unfortunately, we don't have any funding to do prevention work. All of our case load, uh, case workers, or uh, advocates, I should say, are, have huge case loads. So therefore, they're so busy taking care of clients, they're not able to, to be engaged in doing community prevention and education, which is unfortunate um, because there is a lot of need for that. So sometimes we find ourselves piggybacking on like the um, uh, you know uh, awareness campaigns and so on, so to create some awareness and and to do some education. In the community like the White Ribbon Day campaign, um, where we um, educate community uh, communities across the state about uh, obviously working with men, engaging men, and being part of the solution to ending violence against women and, and all gender based violence is, is critical. So we try to do that, but we also try to, to um, we do events ar um, around the um, Sexual Assault Awareness Month and Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, so I'm you know, organizing exhibits, our exhibits, and bringing people. Uh, together doing those opportunities to, um, uh, to, uh, to you know, educate, but it's really uh, difficult to, to do that without, you know, um, some uh, funding so that we can dedicate it to doing a, a, an aggressive prevention education community the, uh, and a campaign that uh, works with, uh, with adults and not just youth because we have a lot of families who sometimes um, wait until it's too late. And, they, and sometimes our immigrant, our clients come to us with fear that they shouldn't have. If they had been educated, if they knew their rights, if they knew the resources, they wouldn't have to be so afraid to ask for help. Um, so uh, we definitely need some prevention education funding. And the budget and legislative priorities that we talked about. Um, I'm wondering if folks on the panel um, have anything else they'd like to share or highlight for legislative staff um, and legislators in the room. Um, let's start. Well, I'll let you decide. Who might want to say anything? Okay. Or I'll call on you. If you <laughs> I think the idea of funding um, statewide um, prevention efforts is so innovative and so important and um, I just really want to impress upon legislators to um, please support that effort because um, I think that absolutely is the pathway that will prevent um, us from having these conversations um, in the future. Some of us won't be around but for the future it's important. So I just wanted to address the campus sexual assault bill. That is okay. Okay. So um, CHH, the Center for Open Healing, mm -hmm. is located in Lowell, which is home to um, University of Massachusetts Lowell, and we also serve like 13, no, 14 surrounding um, towns and cities. No, just towns. Lowell is a city, <laughs> and so uh, in the Merrimack Valley, right? And so. Um, and so the other colleges that are in the area are Middlesex Community College, um, Merrimack College, but just, or Merrimack, is it maybe university? But just to name a few. Um, 
but that's not my data. That's just okay. But our data shows that um, the average age of person that in the last this is like the last two years that comes to seek services has trended down. Like it used to be in um, uh, person, people in the 50s has trended down. So now we're at 35. And the average person who seeks our medical advocacy services, so in the same program, is 19. So that's either college age student. Um, or person in college, right? And so um, across the board, regardless of gender, what I know to be true just based on our data is that um, the first time that someone experienced some level of sexual violence, so that could be um, catcalling, harassment, or experienced some form of violation um, was is seven, right? That's the first age of report. And so, or first age of being violated. And so that also means that that's really the reason we expanded our children's program, because we were seeing like, oh, we could intervene at a much earlier age. And so what, I, what I'm saying is that what is connected to the campus sexual assault bill, or am I saying that right, legislation, is that um, college age students or whether you're in college or not shouldn't really be the first time that you're he either hearing about prevention or receiving some kind of healing considering that so much earlier right seven is like first grade second grade um, is the first time that um, across gender people are experiencing some form of se sexual violence and so what would it look like and so then college is really like second or third time um, violence and so what would it look like to first start prevention and education earlier and for the along the lines of campus sexual assault education and this bill um, what we know to be true based on uh, the Center for Hope and Healing so what I know to be true is that healing doesn't always happen in the place that violence occurred so what would it look like to increased support and access for campus sexual assault, um, campus sexual assault survivors to receive support in the community also. Um, so for example, like the students that come to us only know about the resources on their campus, right? And so that means also the legal, they're only, they only really report to the police on their campus or the um, judicial services on their campus and they're, they're not really sure what else is around them. And so what would it look like to sort of increase and bolster their healing um, across community or um, and across, um, I guess, communities, right? And so I guess that is what is relevant in this bill. And so I wanted to speak to that a little bit. Um, for me, um, you know, uh, because of the extreme fear among our um, immigrant communities, uh, the fear of police um, by many of our immigrant community members. Um, I would like to advocate uh, for Safe Communities Act. Um, we really need to, to make sure that uh, victims and survivors uh, are, um, are not afraid of the police and think of the police as, as, uh, as a resource, an important resource that they can call for help when they need to. And so, um, and, and, and the they shouldn't be um, waiting until it's too late to call for help. So I think that Safe Communities Act would be essential to promoting um, that, and I hope that we can get it passed. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much to our esteemed panelists. This has been really, really, uh, saying really, sorry, very illuminating, and I appreciate what you brought to the to the room and to the legislators and the staff who are still here, thank you. Um, we have a couple of minutes and I, I wanna see if anyone has any questions. We will also have some time in this space until noon if people want to connect individually with folks, but I did wanna give a, a moment or two to any questions that may be burning for folks. <laughs> that's that's completely okay. So um, you know, I, I will do a last sort of pitch for the um, for the legislators and staff that are still in the room, um, just in summary that we 
ask you to um, to support a million dollars in prevention funding in the Healthy Relationships Grant Program line item in both the House and Senate budgets. Um, our member programs will be talking with you about why that's so important, but they have your back. We will, you know, we um, can answer any questions, provide you whatever you need to make your case to your um, Ways and Means Committee, to the leadership in whatever branch you're in. Um, and we also ask that you support all of our legislative priorities, of course, and we will be in touch with you as the bills get assigned to committees, as um, they move through the process. Um, but we, um, Jane Doe, is a resource for you. If you have questions, if language is changing in a bill, we know these things go through a process. Um, we, um, we have opinions and we'll share them with you. Um, and we hope that you'll ask. And, um, you know, we are a resource to you and your local community programs are a resource for you in many ways. And, and policy, yes, their work informs our work, inform, should be informing what's happening here at the State House. Um, and it's also important to get to know what they're doing in your communities and what services they're providing and what role they play, which as you heard today here, they're playing a critically important role in survivors' and families' lives. It's not just, here's a shelter room, it's so much more than that, and often there isn't a shelter room, sorry, um, but it's, it's really about being sort of that that core and sometimes last place that somebody can go and get connected to many other systems and get advocacy throughout them all. So um, I hope um, that folks can stick around and try to connect with um, programs in your region. Um, we, we're trying this fun color coding thing so the, the member programs that are here have a uh, sticker that matches the region. <coughs> in, so if you're not sure who your local program is, just seek them out by that or just go up and say hi to whoever you see. But um, yeah, so uh, anything else you want to add, Deanna? Thank you so much for, um, for your participation and for representing all your colleagues. Thanks. Thank you.